So we have been in 1 John. It's been three weeks since we've been there now. But the author of this, you remember, is the Apostle John. And the Apostle John knew Jesus. And the Apostle John starts off dealing with some of the false teaching that was going on. And he says, we're telling you what we have seen, what we have heard, and what we have touched and experienced. Yes, the Lord Jesus Himself. And so this is a, this is a eyewitness, uh, a man who gives eyewitness evidence to who Jesus is. And his letter, if I were to, to say, here's what it was about. His letter is about forgiveness, it's about faithfulness, and it's about love. It's about forgiveness that Jesus offers us. It's about the faithfulness that He expects us to have in Him because He's faithful. And then the love that through Him flows through us. And so that's what, that's what the letter is all about. The last teaching we did, if you remember, we, did, we call it freedom and forgiveness. Freedom and forgiveness. And so we're at the back end of 1 John chapter 1 and then beginning of 1 John chapter 2. And the very song that we just sang that Gary put to music is, um, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. Not a little bit, not most of it, but all. Aren't we grateful for that? And so that's where we've been so far in the text. So today, I want to talk about and ask this question, are you confident in Christ? Are you confident in Christ? And and notice, don't hear what I'm not saying. This isn't, are you confident in yourself? This is, are you confident in Christ and what He's done in your life? And is there evidence to show that. Here's kind of a question we could ask. It'd go like this. How do you know that you know Jesus? How do you know that you know Jesus? And so today I want us to discover how our confidence really should be evidenced in our actions. Um, that our confidence should be evidenced in our actions. So 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, we pick up, and John says this, and he answers the question, how do you know that you know? He says, this is how we know that we know Him. Guess who Him is in context? The Lord Jesus, right? This is how we know Jesus. How we know that we know Jesus, he says. If we keep his what? Commands. Huh. Pretty quick, right? Pretty quick. How do you know that you know Jesus? He says, keep his commands. And then he says, the one who says, I have come to know him. Know who? Jesus. And yet doesn't keep his commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. Wow. Let's just cut to the chase, John. I mean, right? He's just, I mean, he says, listen, you want to know that you know Jesus? Evidence that you know Jesus is you keep his what? Keep his commands. And if you say you know him, but you don't keep his commands, you're a liar and the truth is not in you. Wow. So I've kind of broken this down and hope this is helpful to, to take a peek at. But here it is. To know Jesus, according to John, is to obey Jesus. Right? If we really know him, we will what? Obey him. To know Him is to obey Him. And this is more than just an act of obedience. This is an attitude of obedience, right? How many people have ever done the right thing for the wrong reason? Me too, right? You've done it because somebody else was looking. You've done it because because what if you get caught, right? You've done it because you've seen the impact it's had in other people's lives, but you really, inside, you didn't want to do that, right? Well, genuine obedience isn't just the action. It's also the, the attitude. It's the heart attitude, isn't it? It's a hard attitude that says, Lord, I want to please you when everybody's looking and when nobody's looking. It's an act and it's an attitude. And so to know Jesus is to obey Jesus. To go further, to obey Jesus communicates that you trust Jesus. Isn't that true? To obey Jesus communicates you trust Jesus. Most of you are parents or grandparents. And we can tell our kids to do stuff. And when they say, Mom, Dad, I trust you, but then they don't what? Do what we say. What what do we usually say to them? You don't, really, you don't really trust them. Because if you trusted us, you would, you'd obey what we say. You would trust that we have your best interest in mind. And so when we break this down again, to know Jesus is to obey Jesus, but to obey Jesus is, is seen as we trust Him. Now the opposite is true as well. Because to disobey Jesus is to not trust Jesus. Isn't that right? He tells us to do things and we say, mm, I think I know better. Doesn't that communicate that we don't trust Him? Isn't that right? I mean, we can blow all, the, blow all the smoke away and we can go, well, I had a reason and other people said. And what, but the truth is, the reason why we don't obey Jesus is because we don't trust what He says. And then to go a little bit further in that, to back it all up, to not trust Jesus, according to John, to not obey Jesus, to not trust Jesus, is to not know Jesus. Is to not know Jesus. Now, remember that John isn't making this theology up. This isn't his version. He's repeating what he's heard the Lord Jesus say. You remember from John chapter 14, the upper room 
uh, conversation that Jesus is having the night before Jesus is the night Jesus is going to be arrested, the night before he goes to the cross. And here's what Jesus says in John 14, 23. If anyone what? Help me. If anyone what? If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Now, word doesn't just mean we see word and we immediately go Bible. No, that's not exactly what Jesus meant. He said, keep my word as you would keep the things that I've told you to do, which are written in the Bible, right? So you'll, you'll obey what I've said. You'll obey the commands I've given. My Father will love him and we will come to him, and I love this, and we will make our home with him by the power of the Spirit he talks about later in this text. Watch this. And the one who doesn't love me will not do what? Will not keep my words. The word that you hear is not mine, but from the Father who sent me. Wow. Who said that, y'all? The Lord Jesus. Isn't John just repeating what Jesus said? Isn't that right? He's not making this up. This isn't John. Is John super conservative and Jesus is what? No, no, no. This is John repeating the words that Jesus said. And so as you, you examine your life and I examine my life, ask this question. As we examine our lives, do our lives demonstrate that we love and that we know Jesus? That we love and that we know Jesus. One question I've asked myself this, and maybe you ask yourself this as well. Do I view obedience as being a privilege or a problem? Is obeying God a privilege or is it a problem? Let me deal with problem first. All right, God, I'll do it because I got to. And what if other people see? See, there's the, it's like, okay, I'll do it because it's just the right thing to do. Instead of going, Lord, what a privilege it is to do what you've told me to do. You've paid a great price for me. And because of that, I want to walk in obedience to you. And with your help, your enablement and the body of Christ you put around me, it is a privilege to do what you've told me to do. See the difference? You ever had your kids respond this way? Okay, I'll do it because you say so, right? As opposed to, all right, mom and dad, I'll do what you tell me to do because I trust you and I love you and I want to please you. And so another way maybe to ask this is, do you do what you do because you have to or because you want to? Do you obey him because you have to or because you want to? And do you obey out of love and loyalty or is out of some sense of duty alone? Right? Now, as we saw at the end of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2, Jesus' death, he has is, he is given his very life in death to make payment for how many of our sins? For all of our sins. And so as we read through 1 John chapter 1, you see that, that John says, listen, if you claim to have no sin, you're a liar, right? Because we've all sinned and we all need a Savior. And then he says, but if we've sinned, we can confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive our sins. And then he goes on to clarify, we shouldn't live in sin, right? This isn't a, okay, blank check to sin. No, we shouldn't live in sin. But then he says, but if you do sin, chapter 2, verse 1, he says, we have an advocate with the Father, and that is the Lord Jesus himself, right? We have a defense attorney who has paid the, the, uh, into our account. And so this is key. This is key. Jesus' sinful, sinless sacrifice for our sin, his sinless sacrifice for our sin, demonstrates that he's forgiven us of all sin. And this is huge. According to Jesus, the one who has forgiven much ought to love much. Isn't that true? Do you remember the story? Jesus goes to a Pharisee's house, do you remember? And, and somehow, a lady who's a prostitute has, has snuck into the Pharisee's house too. you remember this? And so <clears throat> Jesus is talking to the Pharisee, and as he's talking to the Pharisee, this lady comes up and begins to wash his feet. Not with water. She begins to wash his feet with her what? With her tears, right? And then she, she begins to dry his feet with her hair. And then she takes this expensive perfume that she's probably used in her trade and she then bathes his feet in this perfume. Do you remember? And the Scripture says that the Pharisee is wondering why Jesus would let this happen if he knows what kind of woman this is, why would he even let her touch him? Remember that? Well, Jesus knows what he's thinking, and so Jesus says to the Pharisee named Simon, he says, Simon, I've got a story to tell you. And the story goes like this. There were two men that both owed a debt, and one owed a huge debt, and the other one not so huge, but the one that they owed was a gracious man, and he chose to forgive both of their debts. Remember that? And then Jesus asked Simon the question, Simon, which one do you think 
would love, appreciate, be thankful for the one who's forgiven them most? The one who's been forgiven much or the one who's been forgiven little? And Simon says, it's the one who's been forgiven much that would love much. you remember that? Now watch this. Verse 44 of Luke chapter 7, turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she with her tears has washed my feet and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. Can you imagine? As they're talking. Be weird, right? And you didn't anoint my head with olive oil, but she's anointed my feet with perfume. Therefore, I tell you, her many what? How many sins? Many sins have been forgiven. And that's why she loved what? Much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. Let me ask you a question. If Simon was ever at a place that God forgave him of his sins, did God forgive him of just a few sins, do you think? No, he had to forgive Simon of a bunch of sin too. But if you would have asked Simon, who needs to be forgiven more? What, who would have Simon pointed to? The prostitute. And so the story is, is, you know, Simon, the reason why you haven't really cared for me and appreciated me right now is because in your mind, you don't need much forgiveness and you don't need it from me. But this woman understood that she needed much forgiveness and that forgiveness would be found through Jesus. So if you were to answer this question, which one do you think, which one of those two do you think walked out of that place changed? The woman or the man? No doubt, the woman. Because of course, she had been forgiven much. Recognize that. And because she had been forgiven so much, it caused her to do what? Love much. To appreciate the fact that Jesus forgave her for so much. See, it's being forgiven much that ought to lead you and me to love, to trust, and to obey Jesus. Isn't that true? See, when we start with that, look at all He's forgiven me for. Doesn't that lead to a desire to, to honor the One who's loved us much and forgiven us much? Isn't that true? So don't hear what I'm not saying. This isn't. Now, if you live such a good life and you obey all the commands and you do this, then you're right with Jesus. No. The reason why we could obey the commands is because His Spirit has come to live in us. The reason why His Spirit has come to live in us is because we bowed our knee to the Lord Jesus, confessed our sin, recognized our need for Him. Isn't that right? And we love Him much because He loved us more. and loved us before we were lovable. Look at verse 5. But whoever keeps His Word, this is back to John's writing, the letter. But whoever keeps His Word, again, whoever obeys Jesus, truly in Him, the what of God? The love of God is complete. It's mature. Huh. Some of your translations say perfect, but that's what it means, complete, mature. So, whoever keeps His Word, what it shows is that is that the love of God lives in us. And we obey Him out of love for Him. This is how we know that we are in Him. Here we go again. The one who says He remains in Him, remains in Jesus. Remember when Jesus said in John 15, He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who remains in Me will bear much fruit, right? But apart from Me, you can bear no fruit. Remember that? The one who says He remains in Him should walk just as He, that would be Jesus, walked. I don't know about you, but that's where most of us hit the brakes and go, what? What are you talking about? How did Jesus walk? I'll tell you what He's not talking about. He's not talking about His gait, right? He's not talking about His, his, his stride. He's not talking about the, the swagger or whatever you might call it, Jesus. That's not what He means by walk, right? Walk means the lifestyle. Walk is a lifestyle. And He says, the way that Jesus lived is the way that you ought to live. If you really love Him, trust Him, obey Him, you ought to walk the way that Jesus walked. Of course, we can't do that in our own strength. We've got to do that by the power of the Spirit in our own lives. And so, a lifestyle of pleasing God the Father is what Jesus is all about. Isn't that true when you see the Gospels? <clears throat> Jesus says things like, look, I don't do my own thing. I do what I see my Father doing, right? I do what I do to please Him. And that we are to do what we do to please Him. God, have you ever thought about your actions, watch this, today, actually pleasing God? I mean, do we even pause and think about that? Or do we just go about our life and do our thing? Do we ever have a time 
You know, as little kids, our kids would do something, and they go, did you see that, Mommy? Daddy, you see that? You know, jumping in the pool, whatever it is, right? They want you to watch. They want you to watch. Do you ever have a time that you just hit the brakes and you go, did you see that, Father? Because I did that for you. And it was a privilege to do that for you. It's an honor to do that. Verse 7, look, dear friends, or beloved, some translations use. In other words, he's going, I care about you very much. I am not writing to you a what command? A new command, but an old command. Circle that in your notes if you want to. An old command that you have heard from the beginning. The old command, which is the word you have heard, and yet I am writing you a new command, which is true in Him and in you. Get this. He's saying there's an old command I mentioned to you, and there's also a new command that's true in Him and true in you. We'll talk about that in just a second. Because the darkness is passing away, but the true light is shining. What's he mean by this old command? I think, as he deals with in context, we'll see in a second, the old command is something that we've heard in light of the New Testament, but many of us don't know what's taught in the Old Testament or the Old Covenant. And it comes from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Maybe you've heard it. It goes like this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Here it is in context. Do not take revenge or bear a grudge against the members of your community. He's talking to the Jewish people and their cultural relationship. But love your neighbor as you love yourself. I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. Right? So in other words, what he's saying about loving your neighbor, that's not new. That's, that's an old command, right? It's not a brand new command. That's a significant command, isn't it? Does Jesus teach us to do that? Absolutely. That's where we get love God and love people from, right? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. But you know what Jesus taught that, that was like it built on that, but it went to another level? Jesus taught something even deeper, a new command, a new command that John mentions because John heard it. Do you remember the night that Jesus is about to be killed in, all, in John 13 through John 17 is where all that is? And, and you remember that, that Jesus, at one point, after he's told them they're gonna, somebody's going to betray him, Jesus gets down on his knees, brings a basin of water, and he washes their feet. Do you remember that? And then he tells them, what, what I've done for you, the king serving the servants, is what I expect you to do for one another. Remember that? That you ought to serve one another. And then, check this out. Here's what he says later in the same context, verse 34. I give you a what? A new command. In other words, this is something different than what we've talked about before. It's something different than what you've heard before. A new command, love one another as what? As I have loved you. Now, to love your neighbor as you love yourself is significant, isn't it? I mean, if our world, if everybody loved their neighbor like they love themselves, we wouldn't steal from each other, right? We wouldn't hurt each other on purpose, right? But check this out. Jesus takes it to a whole nother level. It's beyond just loving your neighbor like you love yourself, like you want to be loved. Now, it's loving one another, believers in context like Jesus loved us. I don't know about you, but that is easy to say and really hard to do. Look what he says. Love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my, what? People are going to know that we're the disciples of Jesus by the way that we do what? Love each other. If, he says, you love one another. This new command was perfectly pictured in the life of Jesus, wasn't it? Jesus said, greater love has no one that he lay down his life for his friends. And then Jesus did that sacrificially. And so Jesus enables us by the power of the Spirit to do what he's told us to do. And here's our big truth for today. Obeying Jesus is the fruit of knowing Jesus. Isn't that right? that doing what Jesus told us to do is the fruit that we know Jesus who's told us to do it. Isn't that right? Obeying Jesus is the fruit of knowing Jesus. And so those who don't get this, those who don't love their Christian brothers and sisters also need to check whether they really know Jesus. So two things John says. One, if you say you know Jesus, but you don't obey Jesus, what He's told you to do, right? You don't know Him, you're a liar. And then he goes on, look at the text here as we finish up. Verse 9. And the one who says he is in the light, that is another way to say he walks with Christ, but hates his, help me, brother or sister, 
is in darkness until now. Now, in context, you know this, but the New Testament language of brother or sister, and many times it's just the word that we translate brother, but it means those who are in, it means those who are in Christ, right? This isn't just talking about your physical brother. Should you love your physical brother? Yes. Is it hard? Absolutely, right? But, but you, were, you and I, as, as brothers and sisters in Christ, are called to love one another. We know that what Jesus means by love is not just a happy-go-lucky feeling. It's, it's mean that we have their best interest in mind and we're going to treat them that way. And he says this, the one who loves his brother or sister remains where? In the light. Again, paraphrase, in the light is referring to walking in Jesus, right? And there is no cause for stumbling in him, but the one who, watch this, hates his brother or sister is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. No Christian has ever really hated another Christian, have they? I mean, people who really claim to know Christ, they've never ever so held a grudge and not been willing to forgive and not had, had the opportunity to reconcile but had no desire to because they just had a good mat on and they didn't want it. No Christian's ever done that, right? I am so grateful for our church that is so cared for one another. I'm so grateful for our church that, that there have been times that we have come to one another out of love and said, hey, look, we've got to make some things right. I'm so grateful for people who have been incredibly forgiving to me and gracious to me, and so I want to be incredibly forgiving and gracious to them that we would do this together as the body of Christ. Let me ask you a question. You got any room for improvement in your life? Me too, <laughs> Right? I got a lot of room to grow. I got a lot of areas I need to grow, and so do you. And so what if we looked at each other as, as saying, hey, neither of us are there yet, but we're going to walk together there, right? We're going to walk together there. Are you confident? Not in yourself. Are you confident in Christ? That you actually know Him? Because obeying Jesus is the fruit of knowing Jesus. As we obey His commands, we are also to love His people. And so as you examine your life, are there any red flags that pop up on that? Any red flags? I'll ask it this way. Is there any ongoing sin in your life that you need to repent of? Is there any ongoing sin in your life that you need to repent of? This isn't just you hit a speed bump last week and you said something you shouldn't have said. You saw something you shouldn't have seen. This is like as you look at your life, you go, hmm, there's something there that's like pretty consistent in my life. The Scripture says, John says, Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. The reverse of that is if, if you don't obey my commands, it shows that you don't love me. And if we love Him, we obey Him because we trust Him. Isn't that right? So would you examine your own life? Don't examine somebody else's right now, right? Take a moment and examine your own life and ask this question, is there any ongoing sin that I need to repent of? Maybe it's lust. Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's materialism. Maybe it's unforgiveness. How about the second question? Are you consistently loving your brothers and sisters in Christ? And if not, why not? Are you willing to do what it takes from your end to be reconciled to your brother or sister in Christ? Or not? If we go, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Yes, it is a big deal, right? It is a big deal. Because Jesus says, by the way you love one another, the world's going to know you are my disciples. Some of us need to make that phone call, don't we? We need to schedule that meeting. And we need to approach prayerfully and humbly. We need to ask for forgiveness. We might need to extend forgiveness. By the way, just like our King has extended us forgiveness. Colossians says, forgive one another as the Lord's forgiven you. What's He forgiven you for? A bunch of junk, right? A bunch of junk. Yeah. So here's some feet of faith and we're done. I want to challenge you this week in your own life, to love Jesus by choosing to trust Him. To love Jesus by choosing to trust Him. And what I'm talking about is, is that you would view simple decisions and sometimes difficult temptations as the opportunities to love Him by choosing to trust Him in it. Simple decisions, right? Simple decisions. Should I, should I help that person on the side of the road? Simple decisions. Should I, um, you know, should I 
care for this person that, that God's leading me to care for? Should I, should I serve my, my wife, husband? Should I serve my husband with wives? Should I obey my parents, children, right? Simple decisions. And, and get this, that our decision to do that is not just because if I don't, I'm getting in trouble, right? No, we do it because we go, Lord, I love you. And it's a privilege to, to demonstrate my love to you. Isn't that right? I'm going to tell you, where you're going to find joy in your life is when you do that. At least that's my experience. When I find joy in my life is when I choose to obey Him, even when nobody else is looking. And when I choose to obey Him, to say, Lord, I love You, and it's a privilege to love You and obey You because You've loved me first. Thank You, Lord, for this privilege. Right? Second question, or the second thing I'll challenge you to do, again, is to love your brothers and sisters. Get this, by serving them. By serving them. It is really hard to have hate in your heart towards somebody that you're praying for and somebody you're serving. Isn't that right? If you're really praying for God to bless them, grow them, change them, use them, right, and you really mean it, and you're taking opportunities that you've got to serve them in simple ways, to communicate in, in ways that you care, it's really hard to live in hatred towards your brother and sister, isn't it? Or at least it should be. It should be. And so my question, I guess, to close goes like this. What could God do with a church that is confident, not in ourself, but we're confident in the Lord Jesus? And we're confident that we know Him because we know that He's forgiven us much. And because He's forgiven us much and He's empowered us by His Spirit, we desire to love Him with our lives. We desire to serve Him. We desire to obey Him when everybody's looking, when nobody's looking. And that even means in how we treat one another. And so our love for Him overflows to one another so that our culture would say, I don't know what it is about those Christians, but I'm going to tell you something. They got something right. In the midst of all this garbage that's going on in our culture, they see us forgive one another. In the midst of all this garbage that we can be truthful and gracious at the same time, right? We don't sugarcoat truth, right? But we communicate it with grace. Isn't that right? And so church, that's the option that the Lord's, not the option, <laughs> it's the command the Lord's given us. Isn't this right? This is it. That's how we're confident in Christ. We obey Him because He's changed our lives. And because we, He's changed our lives and our brothers and sisters' lives, we love one another. Pretty simple, isn't it? Pretty simple. So if somebody ever asks you, well, how can I know that I know? Take them there. Take them, let them read it for themselves. Let them read it for themselves. And then they're going to have the option to do what we do. And here it is. We either bend our beliefs to fit what the Bible says, or we bend what the Bible says to fit our belief. Isn't that right? 